my presentation is going to be on alien life, the evidences we already have, and the evidences that we could have in the future. So let's get it started. So the, uh, the main question and topic of my presentation is going to be, is there life beyond Earth? So I uh, did some research, found a specific website that I'm going to start out with. It's called futurism.com. Um, what I found, it's about a guy named Thomas Zerbuchin. He's the associate administrator for NASA's science mission uh, directorate. And he says that it is likely that there is life beyond Earth. Uh, his, his quote says, is there life beyond Earth? I think the answer is yes, but we don't just know. Um, this is during an interview at Boston University. He says, the simple reason I think so is because we underestimate nature. Um, sorry. Simple reason I think so is because we underestimate nature when we doubted whether water or complex molecules would exist beyond Earth. Each one of those is much easier to achieve than we thought possible. So basically he's saying that the water that we found and the molecules we found out there in outer space, uh, we didn't think it would be possible to find those things, but we have. So he believes that we're going to continue to be able to find more, which I think he has a good point there. Um, then the article goes on to say that the fact remains that Earth-like conditions in outer space don't necessarily guarantee life, which is also a good point. Then it continues saying um, whether his hunch is right or wrong, his argument won't necessarily make a difference if we don't make sure that Earth can continue to sustain life, which just kind of gets into global warming and other issues, which I won't go into. But uh, the particular website that I found most interesting is called Forbes.com. And it's an article that talks about where we might find alien life and what evidence has already been found for possible life in the universe. So the, uh, although the search for alien life typically focuses on, you know, newly discovered exoplanets, um, it may actually be closer, closer to home that we could find life, according to this article. So... Uh, Jupiter and Saturn combined have almost 150 confirmed moons. There's uh, asteroidal moons and then all the way to planet-sized moons. So the best chance of us finding alien life, according to this article, may actually be closer to Earth than we think. It may be on one of these moons of Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, the article kind of goes through a list of a few that have intrigued scientists based on discoveries they've made. So the first on the list is Europa. This is the smallest of Jupiter's Galilean moons, and it's only slightly smaller than Earth's moon. The, it has the smoothest solid surface of any known object in the entire solar system. This smoothness hints at the existence of like a vast subsurface of an ocean, or like a liquid water. Um, this would be like underneath the surface, so uh, gravitational force, Jupiter, Jupiter changes the gravitational force of Europa. So it's also tidally locked uh, as one hemisphere always faces Jupiter. So a recent discovery in May actually revealed the existence of plumes, which basically means this planet is shooting water vapor into the atmosphere. Um, so this is uh, one of the most alluring places for scientists to search for life because of this and offers scientists an incredible opportunity to study uh, the ocean's composition without needing to actually penetrate the moon's crust. So uh, I'll move on to the second one, it's called Titan. And actually, let me pull up here. This was the first one, this is, um, this is Europa right here. This is just a image I found on Google. And then Titan, this is Titan right here. So this is the next one. Um, Titan is the only moon to have a dense atmosphere. Um, it's also the only place in the solar system other than Earth where stable bodies of liquid can be found on the surface. So it has, it actually has seasonal climate, weather, and has familiar surface features like rivers, dunes, and deltas. However, its atmosphere is nitrogen, not oxygen. And the compelling seas and rivers um, on its surface are actually liquid methane and ethane, not water. 
Titan is also the most distant place that a robot probe has landed. It's the only moon other than Earth that humanity has visited. So in 2005, the atmospheric entry probe called Hugens, it landed on the surface of Titan and on Titan's surface is negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit and the brief data that was gathered revealed uh, complex weather patterns and uh, a surface of like icy grains and rocks like at the site that it landed so it's very rocky um so that is titan this is the uh the third moon we'll talk about this is uh enceladus i believe it's pronounced so enceladus could not be more opposite from titan um like europa its icy crust hides a subsurface ocean of liquid salt water underneath the surface so it uh it not only has the liquid water but uh an internal heat source this also hosts a variety of organic compounds kind of like earth um so this is more evidence that this could possibly support life but in conclusion these moons of the solar system they offer really an unexpected diversity of environments where these scientists can pursue the discovery of alien life or extraterrestrial life. So, uh, continuing on, the second main question of this presentation is going to be, do we need to keep looking for alien life? So on an article on space.com, I, uh, it's kind of a debate between the scientists and the, the sub, the subcommittee, the government and, um, four scientists basically made a case to a panel of senators that Congress should continue to fund NASA's search for life beyond Earth. So, um, Ted Cruz basically comes out and asks the panel, why should we keep searching for life on other planets? And Thomas Zerbuchin, the same guy referenced uh, at the beginning of the presentation, he, he says, I believe it's one of the big questions of all of humanity. This is how great nations make a mark it's by what they do for their citizens, but also how they move history forward. And then uh, we have Sarah Seeger. She's a planetary scientist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, she pointed out, I thought this was a good point. She pointed out that most of the current senior researchers came of age during the moon landings. She says that today the equivalent of that is the search for life. So then the the big thing was oh the moon landing today the search for life is what everyone wants to know we already know that people can go to outer space so um she says that that will inspire the next generation uh to go further into technology um she also states that it takes a ton of pure science research to come up with anything practical things you could never invent if you set out to find something practical uh, she points to GPS technology, which basically it began as a way to track satellites and only later on was used for ground navigation. So, um, with senators pushing the scientists to explain how the search for life in other worlds could benefit humans on Earth is basically what's happening. So they just want to, they want to know why, why should we continue to fund this? So, uh, a lady by the name of Ellen Stofan, she's the director of Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, and she was formerly the chief uh, chief scientist at NASA. She says, when we try to do things that are really hard, like we did at the time of Apollo, when you push yourself to answers the really tough questions, to answer the really tough questions, excuse me, um, that's when you really push technology forward. So, I think she has a good point. I think that in order for technology to advance you have to um you have to do things that people don't necessarily think oh why is there an end to this but it may not necessarily be the end you were you were thinking of the i'm, I'm sure the wright brothers didn't think that their inventing the airplane was going to lead to us being able to fly to outer space one day but that's what that's what the reality is Honestly, from the research I've done, there it turns out there's really no plan for how humanity would respond, let alone how we would deal with something like this. So this would, this would be something that we have really, really we can't plan for this because 
we just our minds don't have any knowledge of what this uh, discovery would be like so um, that would be very interesting but uh, according to lifescience.com there is a uh, they, they run an online survey and they, they kind of wanted to uh, it's the uh, UKSRN which is the UK SETI research network and they, they really wanted to change this by asking people here what are their views on the search for aliens and how would they react to this discovery if it was to happen so the survey has questions that include you know if we discover a signal from extraterrestrial intelligence would you and then the options are you know not care much just follow the news interact on social media and then another one says something like some people think uh we should send messages into space even if we don't receive a message first what is your opinion you know say this is a bad idea or there should be rules or laws about who can send messages and then anybody who wants to send a message into space should be allowed to do so so it's really just a poll that's run to see um how people will react to this topic which i think is good so anyway, continuing on, a few important things that I wanted to uh, tie into this is one, the uh, the Drake Equation. And this was established by a man named Frank, Frank Drake in 1961. And the, the Drake Equation is it's a number, number of letters and uh, exponents. And it's really N, R, F, N, F, 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 I. And it basically goes in for the number of civilizations um in the milky way galaxy the rate of formation of stars the fraction of those those stars the number of planets the fraction of suitable planets the fraction of life varying planets and it goes on and on so this is what we would essentially need to find out if there is life beyond earth so then we also have the seti program and seti stands for the search for extraterrestrial intelligence and it's a project that started in 1959 to search for radio signals from uh, intelligent life in space. So this uses radio telescopes from around the world to just scan the sky and look for uh, patterns in radio waves that could have been sent by somewhere else. Uh, we also have the Fermi Paradox. This basically seeks to answer your question of where the aliens are. And I don't know too much about this, but given... Um, Basically, as the story goes, this uh, Italian physicist, you know, Fermi, he's uh, most famous for creating the first nuclear reactor. He came up with this theory, um, basically with a casual lunchtime remark, and the implications have had extraterrestrial researchers scratching their heads. So, the theory says that Earth should have been visited by aliens already, essentially. So... Moving on to the uh, the Goldilocks hypothesis, this refers to the the habitable zone around a star where the temperature is just right. It's not too hot, not too cold, and for uh, liquid water to exist on a planet. And then, lastly, the uh, the Martian meteorite. This is a rock that actually formed on Mars and then was ejected from Mars uh, by the impact of an asteroid or comet or something, and then it finally landed on Earth. So, um, of over 61,000 meteorites that have been found on Earth, uh, it was identified that 224 of them were, uh, supposedly Martian meteorites. Personally, I think that there very well could be life out there. I think that we should continue to look because, um, it just makes sense to me that if... You know, from a Christian perspective, if a God would allow us to um, to s find the things we have and to even go to outer space, then you would think he wants us to to search, to, to pursue that. And um, it's the same thing as, you know, when people came over to America, um, God, God wanted us to, to search the earth and find find what he had for us so maybe we still have lots 
to see in the universe. Maybe we don't. Maybe we are never going to find um, any life beyond Earth, but none of us really know. So um, anyway, that is all the research that I have for this presentation. And thank you all for listening. I hope you all have a great evening.